kept this like in the way. Okay. Like so slide it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's way better. Okay. Is that good? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. We want to. <laughs> this is okay right here. That one else is fine. Yeah. Which one? Oh, I'm sorry. I can get that cool out the way in those guys. Everybody, what I'm going to do because we're live right now on Facebook, and y'all can wave everybody, and we can start in three, two, one. Good evening, candidates for mayoral of uh, Ypsilanti. Um, my name is Dr. Jania Porter, and I am happy to be your moderator this evening. Um, this is scheduled to be a informal yet informative um, forum about the topics and issues concerning the citizens of Ypsilanti. Um, I started, or my why in becoming um, interested in, in being a part of moderating this uh, forum is because I have um, two nieces, well now I have three nieces and a nephew, but at the time, I had two young nieces who live on the south side of Ypsilanti, and about a year ago, they were playing in their home, you know, drawing, coloring, playing, and were um, involved in um, a bystander shots who rang out through their home. They had to drop on the floor, received a in the moment. Um, lesson in combat crawling military crawling if you will their mother was there and you know from that time i just wanted to become more involved not only that but i began my uh, teaching career in the city of ypsilanti my youngest son graduated from uh, ypsilanti new tech and his wife as a matter of fact and so you know um, ypsilanti is a community that is near and dear to my heart. But that being said, I do have concerns about, you know, where we are as a, as a community. And so when an opportunity arose for me to moderate and to be and to get involved, I jumped at the chance. And so that is a little bit about me and my why, um, why I'm in front of you today. And so um, as we start, I want to introduce each of our candidates for Mayor of Ypsilanti, starting with candidate Nicole Brown and in the center candidate Anthony Morgan and then uh, candidate Lois Allen Richardson. Did I get that right? Okay, all right, wonderful. So um, introductions are out of the way. I've shared my why. I do wanna provide about one minute for each of you to take um, a moment to share your why. Why are you here, your background, however you'd like to use your minute um, with the audience here at the library and on the live event. So, Candidate um, Brown, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me and agreeing to moderate this forum for us. Um, so, my name is Nicole Brown, and I'm running for the seat, of course, of mayor. I currently serve as the mayor pro tem and council member for Ward 1. And my why is simple. Um, I became civically engaged when I was 15 years old in the city of Salani. And the first thing that I did um, as a part of this youth group that I participated in was come to council and talk about what the needs were for young people like myself and the community with my peers. Um, and at that point, I recognized that, you know, working in cohesion and collaboratively with people was something that I really wanted to do. Um, and I found my way into communications and social work. Um, I'm now a clinical social worker, and I work as a supervisor at a children's mental health agency out of Wayne County, actually, 
where I work every day um, to strengthen families, strengthen our young people, and really just provide safe spaces and places. And so I feel like that work really translates into the work I've been able to do on council. And so as mayor, I intend to do just that, um, threaded throughout economic development, threaded throughout you know, safety, threaded throughout public services. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Morgan. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Dr. Porter, and I thought you knew. I appreciate you guys that have us here. Hello, Facebook. My why is um, it's, it's not complicated, but it's, it's a few different factors. And I believe um, being here 22 years um, and having the daughters of 19 and 16, who just graduated from ECA and goes to Eastern. Um, what you mentioned about the violence and certain things that's happening here is a story that's too common here versus a, a small city with big city issues. And um, having done youth enrichment, the nonprofit work, working in our education system for over 15 years in each discipline, um, getting to know families. And you understand that over the time, families, finances, and futures are the things that are a common thread for people that you serve. And, um, and as I worked here for over 20 years, um, as a natural calling of the people thought that um, there should be a higher capacity to serve. Um, so I'm grateful, I'm, I'm excited to be able to just um, take the work that I've done and hopefully magnify it. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Alan Richardson. Good evening to everyone on Facebook and a great big thank you to Mr. Tyrone Bridges for hosting us and thank you Dr. Porter for being the facilitator. Um, my why is I was born and raised in the city of Ypsilanti. I am a proud product of the Ypsilanti Public Schools and I still support public schools. Um, I um, I've been on council for a number of years, and I first got involved because I didn't like what was going on in the city. I had lived away as um, a foreign missionary for a while, and when I came back, I just didn't like what I saw going on in the city. And I came back just at a time when gangs were just beginning to form. And I spoke to a couple of, um, at a church and, and said, and told them that what was going on and hope that we could change it. I have been working in the community since I was a child and started in sixth grade and will continue to work in the community until I leave here. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, again, thank you all for sharing your why. So as I shared before the start of the live event, this is meant to be an informal uh, forum or dialogue. We want it to be informative. We want it to be substantive for the community and so that they can make their decision on who they want to serve as their mayor of this planning. And so with that being said, um, I have a number of topics received from um, online, from here at the library, um, from um, colleagues that I, who I've lunch with, you know, over the last couple of weeks, they're like, oh, you can moderate Wait a minute, we got a question. So um, questions from lots of different areas. I will start with one candidate at a time with a topic, and then I will open it up to the remaining two candidates to respond accordingly. Please limit your responses to two minutes, and um, I am going to proceed to the first topic. So the first topic concerns the violence in Ypsilanti. Um, initially, I started to put this topic at the end, but you know what, it's at the top. It's at the top of everyone's concern. It is, um, it is an, Kennedy Morgan said it, said it best, it's a small city with big city issues and violence is one of those issues. So recently, two days ago, I believe, there was a shooting that happened in the West Willow um, community. It happened on live stream on Facebook Live. And there, it, it's a microcosm of the culture of Ypsilanti that is a cu culture of violence that has been represented in Ypsilanti. And so my question to you first, Candidate Brown, is your thoughts on that? And what do we do about that? And how do we stem this culture of violence, two minutes. Yeah, thank you for that question, and I, I knew, I assume that would be asked. Um, so, you know, on Tuesday, actually, I was in Lansing for a legislative advocacy day when I got the, the text that this happened in the township. Um, I just do want to clarify that it happened in a Tulane township, not within the city, but again, we are all one community and it impacts us all. We have families, we live in all these different spaces. Um, and the first thing that I thought about was what could have been done 
before this occurred to mediate the situation that was happening. Um, you know, we've heard stories about the reasons, the roots. I don't actually know. I wasn't, you know, I'm not close to any of those individuals. But I think the thing that we need to do is really put resources into current programs of folks who are proximate to the community and those who live there to really talk to them and get to the root of, like, the why. You know, why are people resorting to gun violence rather than being able to have a conversation? You know, why is it that, um, you know, we don't have people that we can go to in our community to really talk through these issues. And so I think one of the first things that I've been talking about throughout the campaign is an unarmed crisis response team. Because number one, we know that folks don't want to talk to the police when they're in the personal issues or when they're having their basic needs being unmet. Um, but in situations like this, there could have been someone who was trained in mediation that could partner with another community member who maybe knew these individuals to bring them to the table to have a conversation about the conflict. Um, I think that sometimes that it, it may not work, right? But we would have at least had a step um, to try to defuse the situation before it turned into something like this. And it reverberates, right? So now this has happened. We don't know what's going to happen next with retaliation and folks who are hurt on both sides of this horrible incident. Um, so I really do think that what we need is an increase in mental health support in our community for folks to be able to have outlets um, to share when they're having difficulties, no matter what the root cause is, um, as well as individuals who are willing to come together, be trained in, you know, um, crisis intervention, and use our skills as a community to really get to the root of it together. Because what we know is the police are not going to solve these problems. Thank you. Sorry. Candidate Morgan, candidate Alan Richardson, responses. Either one. Oh, either one. Okay. Uh, I would just like to respond by saying in August of 21, um, I was at an event that was, uh, was an outdoor giveaway, and there had been two or three killings that the last two weeks before that. And as I was walking around, we were giving out backpacks for people to come from Alabama. We were giving out backpacks, and it just, my heart was heavy because one of the young men, um, that had been shot was the son of a young man that um, was really quite close to me. We had a good relationship and my heart was heavy and I, there were several people there that were working with youth and it just hit my heart. They're all working, my brother's keepers and this group and that group and another group and they're all doing excellent work. So why are we still getting all of these shootings and deaths and it just hit me to bring them together so that we stop working in silos and begin to work together and i asked each one of them they quickly agreed to me and we started it the very next week we started a conversation and before it was over that meeting at the end everybody said we can't stop here we got to go on so we've been meeting for over a year we came up with 14 different items that could be used to help stop the virus. We've been working diligently on it. And some of you might have heard of the uh, Council on Criminal Justice. We met with them and we compared the things that we had come up with, that they had come up with. And one of the things that is a grief, uh, we have a grief group that goes out. You know, some, most of 80 to 85% of the killings are retaliatory. So if we can help people, the youth work through their grief, and that's just one of the things that we're doing. We started that already. We are now rolling out this. The county has given us over $2 million to work on it. So some things are being done and things, we just need people to come. We met this afternoon and we are actually starting. We're going to have a uh, memorial wall built. Uh, if not built, we're looking for a wall where we can do a mural and put everybody's that has been killed name on it. But we are reaching. We go have a group that goes right into the hospital when someone has been shot, so they're not there by themselves. So, candidate Brown mentioned mentorship. Candidate Allen Richardson, you've mentioned, you've mentioned uh, grief groups and uh, the like. Candidate Morgan, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I think, uh, thank you so much, uh, and I appreciate the things that um, my former colleagues shared. Um, this is a multifaceted issue, and I think it takes a multifaceted solution. Um, the one uh, small creation was called White Town Swag, which is summer without any guns, um, because there's trends that happen over the country that when it's, it's hot in certain areas, that's when 
or gunplay, more violence in certain neighborhoods come up. But um, you mentioned something about it being a, a microcosm of Ipsy. And um, if you look at that from 2010 to 2022, um, probably 50, 55 bodies have been on the ground um, in, in, in areas. And we're talking about 4,897, 4,898. And they all, around 94%, are the same demographic. So we're talking about who and, and why and how. So we're talking about um, this. And it starts off, and I, and I don't want to stray too far, but it has to be um, because it's national, state, and local. And local is just, I think, a microcosm of the national narrative of that Black male humans sometimes have a low self worth, which allows some of these things to happen in our own neighborhoods. Okay. And not that we're just seen, but how we see ourselves sometimes. And that's not the end all be all. But when we're talking about these task force like Man Up, Kid Down, The Interrupters, My Brother's Keeper, um, it doesn't get to the core issue of how they're seen. And uh, again, we're talking about retaliatory. This is a 4.3 mile uh, radius where most people know each other. They know where you are. You can't hide. It's family legacy. So I think, uh, again, getting to the root of some of these causes, however, uh, so this is psychological and emotional. And uh, I think uh, a cultural <coughs> communal thing, because when we mentioned violence and safety, um, these are individual things, however, community wide. So I think versus Southside versus Mac, uh, Arthur over here in um, West Willow would it have a different view of what safety looks like in Ward 2 and Ward 3, although the county has a view of what Ypsilanti looks like in Green and Lot. So I think it takes some um, different views and different perceptions and different uh, elements to make. But first, I think getting some of these people together um, and, 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 and encouraging these young people who, uh, who have very little to do to, um, to see better themselves. Well, and definitely um, there's something to be said about a facet that each one of you have spoken about. You know, I've spoken to, as an educator, I've had the privilege of speaking to many young people, and I know that young people are in our community are feeling hopeless. They do not think that there is a solution. And so, you know, we have to, all of us work together to find out how to access how to reach them to give them hope because right now there's not there's not hope and that um that kind of thinking and concern really goes along with one of the uh polls that i thought you knew uh filled it to the facebook poll they asked the following question so they gave a, uh, several problems for voters in the city of Ypsilanti, and they with the caveat that all of the following should be highest priority, but among the participants who submitted to the poll, the second highest at 24% of concern is crime, shootings, murder rates, drugs, et cetera. So it is something that's on the precipice of everyone's mind. Um, and with that being said, you know, in the township, so candidate Brown, you mentioned township issues. So in Ypsilanti Township, there is a there's a gun range that is that was just passed and um and i'd like to know what are your thoughts about that yes it's the township but it's close to us it's in our backyard we've got these issues and so candidate morgan i'd like to ask you what are your thoughts about that and, and you know how do we move forward well well let's talk about guns being a gun sense candidate though guns are Again, um, within the fabric of the American culture, I mean, it won't leave um, the responsibility of how to interact with these guns, how to interact with some of these laws that allow certain weapons to get in certain neighborhoods. Um, now, again, a gun range is um, people with the Second Amendment right to have guns. It's a place where I believe that gun range to shoot, but this is a place to practice aim. Um, and again, it's almost like the, 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 in my mind, putting a dispensary next to someone with an addiction issue. Right? It, it may not cause in, like, immediate issues, but I think some of the effects over time. Um, again, we hear gunshots a lot. Um, it, 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 it could cause, it could re, re affect some trauma, or I don't, I don't have enough foresight to know what a gun range could do. I, I don't think that's the best use of taxpayer money to be in there. I'm not a, a county, I don't live in a county. So, so yeah, any, I'm, 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 I'm Gun sense, um, I don't think guns will be here forever. Um, now how we choose to control them would be, uh, this, uh, this would be a collective historical uh, effort. Thank you. Candidate Brown, candidate 
and Richardson, either of you have a response to the recent approval of the gun range in the township? Um, back when it was being voted upon, it was brought to me several times, that, and I know that there was a um, community action group that was really pushing against it. And there are two theories of thought on that, that I have some friends that um, not live, they don't live here, but they have guns and they are trained. And one of them is a trainer for people that want a uh, permit to carry guns. And the th their theory is that the more that people know about guns, how to handle guns, how to respect guns, that it makes a difference. And it is, but, and as he said, guns are a part of our culture. There are diehards that are never ever going to give up on uh, the second amendment. Uh, I strongly uh, uh, support the gun pass bill that was passed this past week. However, I don't believe it went far enough. I believe that um, nobody needs an AK-15. Nobody should be walking down the street or being allowed to carry an AK. Why do you need a gun like that? That's just gonna, you know, kill many people at one time. I um, do believe that people that own guns should be more responsible because it has been proven that many of the guns that are used in the street shootings that they have been stolen or that they are parents' guns that they have not properly locked up. I am not a gun proponent, and I was not in favor of that gun range going in there. However, the people that uh, control the township, they were, and it is there, you know. So we have to um, try to figure out how we're going to work around this work with it so that it does not increase the number of guns on the street. Yeah, I, honestly. I I don't have much different to say than my, my colleagues because I think guns are not going anywhere. We know that now. What I do think though is that there was an outcry from the community, in particular from the Black community, um, who gathered together to approach them about their concerns about putting this range into the township. And I think that's where the issue lies, right? You know, that the voices that came to them and gave their unique perspective and their lived experience should be respected and should have been met with some different conversations um, prior to moving forward. Um, I think that if it's gonna happen, which is passed, it's gonna happen, then the things that they have to focus on now is education. I think that is the root of all of this, is educating folks on gun safety. Um, and then they have to have other mechanisms in place for later on in the event that there are consequences to making that decision. So, you know, even within the city, I wanna increase, you know, gun buyback programs and providing gun locks to families and to parents so that they can safely secure their firearms if they so choose to have them. Um, we, we just have to be proactive again. And I think the proactive thing to have done would maybe have been to bring the community together first and have some forums, maybe such as this, to talk about that gun range rather than just be at the table and make the decision themselves. But since they have made the decision, then it's time for them to be proactive with the methods that they're going to utilize to make sure that they don't create additional harm to communities that are already being harmed by guns disproportionately. Um, like Anthony said, we see our black men bodies are falling at the most at this rate. And like the current mayor says, you know, guns are being stolen out of cars. People are not safely, you know, putting them away, storing them. And so we have to educate folks on what they need to do so that we do not continue to perpetuate a problem because this gun range is nothing, right? So and in your your statement makes me think of another question or another issue, which is, you know, um, people, citizens who are more affluent and more educated, perhaps more aware and knowledgeable, knowing how to circumvent the system or to navigate the system to get laws and, and rules approved, but then populations and communities that are more vulnerable have to face the repercussions, right? And so, you know, I want to, I, I'm going to push a little bit more because I, I'm not, I, I wasn't really satisfied with that um, response. And so I want to hear a little bit more about how do, does the city of Ypsilanti keep their citizens safe so that if 
rules and, and decisions are being passed in the township that it's not up to the citizens in Ypsilanti that are cleaning up the mess, right? So I want to hear a little bit more, and I'm going to open it up to whoever wants to jump in first. Well, I, I do want to jump in. Um, for, for some time when we had a, a small violent outbreak in 2019, um, People may think that, and again, it's kind of convoluted because the MC has become a stop group and a haven to, to commit crime. Uh, being right off 94, having certain um, dispensaries and certain other agents that lure people um, as, as, as ways to come up. Um, they, so we've had people come here, do crime, shoot, leave bodies. And again, we're here to clean it up, regardless of, so we're in proximity to that. Um, but then we're talking about transparency here about how something gets from a, some stage to now being passed. And we as a city have been accused of moving things through without the public eye having a credible, long-standing eye on it. Or even if you tell people enough times, sometimes people feel like um, the avenue that we showed or gave, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't utilized. And so still the information hasn't reached the people. And again, so they can take that by surprise and look at it as being underhanded. Um, but again, procedural, some things pass without the public eye, um, and some things are fully in the public eye that people just don't uh, oppose one another for a long time. So um, I don't know how it be again. Um, there's a procedure to it, so we can't say that um, it, was, it, it was fair. It just maybe not have been. Um, so again, that's how things can happen. Of uh, uh, those uh, that double-sided uh, prompt of um, being um, things moving at a pace that the community is not privy to, and um, things that are being blasted that some people ignore until uh, it's too late. <clears throat> Would anyone else care to respond? Uh, yeah, I think in addition, you know, something that I've talked about heavily is just being proximate to the issues. I think people don't tend to care until the land's on their roadway. Um, and so proximity, presence. Um, you know, we talked earlier about mentorship when it comes to violence. We talked about, you know, programming. But it, it, it's all of those things, right? Making sure that we don't sit at a table and pretend that it's not an issue until it impacts us directly. Um, you know, the shooting that happened a few years ago in, in Ward 1 was pretty important to my home. I was in my house when those gunshots went off at that block party. So no, it wasn't a relative of mine, but it was a neighbor, right? It was, it was in the neighbor's yard. And even then, right, when I was, talking about this at the day is there were people who did not think that violence was as big of a problem as it is because it wasn't in their neighborhood even. So I think it's proximity. I think that we have to make sure that we stay committed to doing what we need to do around education. I, I still I'm rooted in that in education. And I also think that what you know former Councilmember Morgan, I was like that I correct if I said Councilmember, but former Councilmember Morgan said about you know increasing self-esteem in our young people so they understand they have hope for the future and if there is something bigger than maybe the the issues or the conflicts that they're facing with their peers um and not turning to guns and violence as the answer because there are many other ways um to to of course correct fix issues and as well move yourself move yourself forward and so if there's no hope within our young folks then we're going to continue to see see these issues because they, they don't feel like they have things to look forward to and to, and to really live for, right? Um, another piece of this is, and I know we've talked about this extensively, is somewhere for young people to go. You know, we need a rec center on this side of the county. And I mean, we all talk about this. This is not legal information. I didn't make this up. We need a space that is safe for families, for our, you know, members of the uh, older population to come and commune and fellowship where they can be and, and form community in the ways that it used to be. We've lost a lot of those spaces. And so I think that is another step that it's not just the city that can do that. We need support from the county, from the state to make that happen so that we have other avenues and other opportunities for our young folks to participate in so they're not out here getting involved in the things that are leaving them down the path that we, that we see. So you mentioned prevention, you mentioned education, you mentioned community resources all things that are definitely good things to have in place. Um, candidate, yeah. you like to um, I agree with, with both of them. And they were talking about, and I think you asked about part of your question, if I was, and if I'm wrong, you can correct me, was about involvement from, um, from residents. I have been on council now for a number of years, and that has been one of the hardest things that I have worked at and over and over again, 
particularly in uh, Ward 1, Precinct 1, which is the predominantly Black area, I beg people, come to council. They stop me. Why is this happening? Why is it? Please come to council. When we have, and I think the two of them can agree with me, when we have a council, a subject on council on the agenda, and people come and pack out the council room, I have seen I, uh, attitudes, I've seen decisions and thoughts on council change because they're hearing from the people and they're seeing the people. And so I have begged people, literally beg, please come. Um, as far as the rec uh, center, I can proudly say that in our meeting today, and the group that I'm talking about is Community Violence Intervention Team. And um, the CEO, Greg Deal of the county was there today. And there we have isolated four separate places that are being looked at to build a community center. And uh, it's Atlantic Water Street is one of those places. However, that requires a lot of remediation, would take a whole lot of money to do that. But I can sit here and I can say, we decided when we first had this group that we wanted to hear what the kids said. And we asked, and that was the number one thing is we need something to do, someplace to go. And we have heard them and a uh, rec center is coming to the east side of Washington County. And I can't wait for it to get here. All right, we look forward to that. So shifting gears a little bit, um, going back to the I Thought You Knew viewers poll, the first issue, so I meant, mentioned that the second, um, uh, second area of concern, theme of concern was crime. The first area of concern is housing, access to stable housing, owning a home, et cetera. That led the way at 28% of viewers who um, took the poll. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about housing. And um, we know that the current makeup of Ypsilanti is, you know, we got a lot of young folks, we got a lot of black folks, we got a lot of renters, and there is a need for affordable housing, especially COVID crisis, inflation, things are through the roof. So you know, I'm curious to know, and I'm going to start with you, candidate Alan Richardson, um, how do you plan to increase affordable housing? Now, wait, let me add a caveat. I know that there is some uh, current uh, work with the 220 North Park. Am I saying that right? So I know that that's there. Um, I know that the parcels there are, people have some concerns about the, the size and that there's 300 units there, if I'm not mistaken or thereabouts. thereabouts. Um, and so, but there's a need for more affordable housing. So opening the field to you, how do we pro provide more affordable housing to the city of Epstein? Okay, um, the city council at our last meeting, we approved two community benefits agreements. So we have some housing coming. Uh, there will be uh, 300 plus apartments at 945 Clark Road. There will be uh, over 150 apartments at 845 Clark Road for seniors. All of this will be affordable housing. And in the 220 North Park, there 40, 50% of those homes will be affordable. And that is for purchase. And that is one of the things that I really uh, want to see is that we move people towards home ownership and particularly we as black people we need to own and there was a time when we did I remember the uh, time growing up there on the south side what is now called the south side it wasn't then of uh, Ypsilanti the most of the homes that blacks lived in they built them themselves with the help of the neighbors everybody worked together and built a home and then they built another home but they were owned and i think we have to move back start pushing people back to that so i'm very excited about 50 percent of 220 and the affordability will stay with the house 
So if I buy a house at 220 at an affordable rate, when I leave 10, 15 years later, it has to sell at an affordable rate then. It cannot go totally up to full market value. So that gives another person an opportunity to come in and buy a home. I purchased a home about five or six years ago, and I had to purchase it because I needed to move from where I was living, but I couldn't afford rent. And my mortgage is still today cheaper than rent would be. So I just, I have to buy. And I think when people understand that they can, uh, many people think they can't afford to buy, but when they understand that their mortgage might very well be less than what rent is. And so I've been pushing people towards some of the uh, programs that train people in home ownership. Okay. Thank you. Well, certainly, um... Uh, what are those called? Rental caps, I think is what you're mentioning uh, with the caps on the, or, or housing caps rather, certainly uh, some benefit to that. Candidate Morgan, would you like to respond? Thank you. Um, this, uh, this will be, again, it's number one on the list for a reason. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, some of these definitions that get thrown around so easily up in here. They're thrown around, they're not, they're digestible, but you know, when we think about affordable housing, right? And when we think about accessible housing, and we think about equitable housing. Um, just because it's affordable, that means to move when we're talking about a main divide. When we're talking about Washington County having the biggest divide in the country, when we think about between Barton Hills and West Willow. So when we have someone particularly that could live in Ann Arbor, um, who can't afford to live there, so they can buy one home, they can sort of sell a home in Ann Arbor, buy two or three here, rent them out, make a living here in a city where people who've grown their whole life can't afford one. And so uh, we're 30% homeowners, 70% renters. And I do believe uh, if I had an idea of when we talk about capping, people don't like to hear um, capping and think about um, uh, some way of restrictions. Uh, but I do think if we could do a buyback of some of the, any of the uh, apartment owners that own over 300 properties, I think it would be a great idea for the city to attempt to buy some of these properties back and have some of those stock for senior living for affordable housing for real for those below a certain AMI. Because I do think people think um, um, affordable is synonymous with low income, which uh, doesn't allow people to fully buy into it because density is needed in our city. We do need to build up. However, um, there's different eyes on different parts of, uh, again, those who can get access to a house, those who can actually afford it versus those um, thank you. Uh, versus those who can actually um I can say affordability is just a tricky word when it depends on uh, those who can't afford to live in Ipsy, who can't afford to live anywhere. So if we can afford to live other places outside of our city can come here and live happily. And that's a, a big issue. Thank you. Candidate Brown? Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, I won't go back over what we just did at council. I'm very proud of those two developments and the CBA process. Um, the density is necessary. I think one of the things that as a, a council we need to work with is collaborating with the county to really go out and look at these, these properties that are not developed and redevelop them into housing. Um, and, and, and we can have mixed levels of affordability, right? So kind of like what Mr. Morgan just said, people hear affordability, they think low income. That doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, our 220 property had 50, 50% AMI, 60, 70, so it went up. And so that way it was available to multiple facets of people. But our focus should be to keep the people that are already here and want to be here, here, right, in their homes. If we should be focusing on allowing you know, our aging community to age in place so they don't get pushed out because they cannot afford their increasing rents. And so the way to do that is increase the number of access to housing. Right? We have property here that is not developed, and we can also talk about businesses, but even those opportunities should be mixed use. But we can have businesses on the bottom and housing on top, so that folks have the availability of housing within their means. Um, you know, everyone doesn't want to own a house. That's another thing. Everybody doesn't want to be a homeowner. They may want to rent, but you should still be able to afford to do so if that's your choice. And so it's our job to collaborate because we know that within the city, we don't have the financial ability to just go out and do it on our own. So we need to seek the supports and the resources from those who do have it, starting with the county level, starting with our state legislature, to make sure that we go to these properties that we see that are vacant, that are dormant and sitting, and utilize them for what we need, which is housing. It's a basic need, it's a human right. Um, and so it's our job to go out and seek that if they're not going to come to us. We need to advocate for people. 
um, to make sure that we can develop housing and keep our folks here. And if people want to come in as well, you folks, fine. But we need to make sure we take care of ours first. I like that idea of taking care of our own. Um, certainly, definitely need it. Um, candidate Alan Richardson, you mentioned the Water Street development. And the one question that I have on my in my notes is, what's the deal with the Water Street? And the reason why I say this is because I remember, like, I, I was an undergrad at Eastern. This was in the 90s. I remember, you know, big signs, we close, we're about to develop Water Street, and it was about to be a big deal, and 20-something, yeah, been out of college, I don't know how many years. What is, what is, what's going on? Okay, if I can make a record, it was actually in the early 2000s. 99, 2000 is still a long time. Yeah, so it what's is. the, no, what's no, the no, deal? I'm yeah, I, 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 I'm just trying to, you know, I get make it. it yeah, yeah, no, I get it. it. I, but my question it's remains, what's the question, deal with it? Your question is still very valid. And um, I asked the same question. Um, we had, a, the city had a developer and it was in the process when I went on council. We had a developer and they, tested the ground and it was buildable. The developer was a clean, a green space developer. And once they removed the buildings and we have um, had a person, uh, an activist in the city that kept telling them that that ground was very dirty because there had been a car dealership there, there had been a phone plating place there, there had been a newspaper there, and, and all of that, and back then people dumped things into the ground. So when they dug, they tested the ground before, they pulled these buildings down, they hit shale and they thought that it was clean and tested. And then once everything was down, they could drill deeper and they found out, I mean, all kinds of mucky, ucky stuff under there. And it was, it's too dirty, it's too brown for anyone to actually live on. You could build and go come in, come in and out, but you can't, no one can actually live on it. And that's what, it needs to be cleaned up. And that's one of the things that I was speaking even with the um, CEO of the county today about helping us and seeking some, to get it cleaned up. There have been developers that have come and looked at it and it will take close to $30 million to clean it up before they can build. The last developer that we that wanted to look at it, they were willing to reach out and try to get that kind of money, thank you, to, um, to do the building. But it's gotta be cleaned up. And I would just like to say, I don't know if this is one of your questions or not, but it's something before the city removing the Peninsular Dam. It is and I keep, yes. I keep cautioning I keep saying well, gonna, So wait, I'm going to time out because I'm going to get to that question. So I'm going to put you on hold just for just a second because we're going to get to the dam. Okay. Uh, but thank you for that response. So to my candidates, um, candidate Morgan, candidate Brown, we've heard what the deal is with the Water Street development. It's brown, it's a, it's a brown, brown, field. brown, what's it called? Brown field. Brown field. So if you should you become mayor of Ypsilanti, I'm gonna go to you first, it's your turn. So should you become mayor of Ypsilanti, what's your next step to address that issue? So the next step is pretty much what I was talking about in the previous question, to first of all, collaborate with the county and the state so that we can remediate the land if, if we could on our own. Otherwise, we need to be marketing that property to developers um, and giving them the incentives and that would trigger the community benefits process as well so that they can help to fund remedi remediating the land and also putting in the necessary infrastructure. Um, I think that one of the, the, the wise things that happened after the body that voted to you know, purchase Water Street realized that things were not going so well was to cut it into parcels to try to sell it, right? That was a really smart step when they couldn't get the whole thing sold. Um, but one of the drawbacks that we end up with is one parcel being sold that is now the family dollar that really hasn't really done much. It doesn't really look that great. We've talked to them about how we can support better help them, um, but it didn't pan out the way that folks have planned by breaking it up and marketing it in different pieces. So what we need to do is try to get that piece of land sold 
um, and put things on it that are walkable for individuals. So again, mixed use housing, business on the bottom, maybe housing on the top, maybe some housing on the back, a grocery store in our community. I mean, those are the things that I'm thinking about talking to developers about that want to come into Ypsilanti. What can you bring to us that our people need? Not necessarily some advance that people want, but what do we need? And it may not be the perfect thing, but it might be the right fit. If, if it's not the right center, which is my number one wish, um, then we need to at least be open to what other possibilities are there. And housing um, and us being a food desert are top of mind in, in that process. So, you know, market, 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 talk it up. We need to be willing and open to talking to whomever fits the bill for what we're looking for um, and not shy away from maybe some things that are not perfect, um, but necessary. Thank you. Candidate Morgan. Thank you. Um, I want to add perspective to it because uh, I am a short-term civil servant. And I just want to let you know that being a short-term civil servant, you can make a decision that can have long-lasting effects for generations of people in the city that you serve, which is what Water Street is. We're talking about how much money was lost. We're talking about the fact that those that made that decision at the time uh, thought it was a great idea. We're talking about processes, procedurals, and outcomes. In the city, we did nothing with it. Um, a lot of money was recouped, and we're probably just getting out of debt from it. And then when we're talking about, it's not who did what or place of blame. We're talking about um, where there's remediation, what we need. Uh, like now, we, whether a train stop, whether we're pent dam removal, whether it's uh, Water Street, you know, we have to have a representation that's going to be accountable to what we did before moving forward. Everyone wants to move forward as opposed to taking the time to assess where we went wrong um, and how uh, we can do our best to offset that issue in the future. Because if you think about $40 million and nothing has happened, then there's a lot of families and, and still generations of families are gonna pay for that. And I think those are some of the things that, again, as a, as a mayor, um, my goal is not to just rush to the next thing, but to um, look at the sustainability of the infrastructure that we created. Again, some people may sleep well at night after making that decision 10 years ago, but there's still people who can't sleep at night because of that decision. And so I want to make sure we give careful thought to some of these long lasting um, uh, decisions and outcomes that we come to, even being a short term to the service. So it's that serious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Canada Average said, you set, the, you set the stage with the history. I want to give you one minute to respond to the question should you be um, elected? Um, moving forward, what would you do differently? What would you do with the Watch Street development? Thank you. The first thing I would try to do is to get help, whether I would, from both the federal, the state, and the county, uh, in getting the land cleaned up. That would be the first step, to get it remediated where people can live on it. And we've had, uh, a couple of really good offers to build on it. One, they built, they dealt with the ground field and they were ready, but uh, they could not, Mishta, there was a glitch with Mishta, but I would love to see us be able to get that land cleaned up and then bring in developers. One, developers that would um, have um, affordable housing. And for me, my definition of affordable now is not just low income or HUD housing as we've often thought of it, but affordable is what anyone in this room could afford. And we all are, might possibly be at different income levels, but we all should be able to buy a house that is safe and that is sturdy that we can afford. And so I do believe, I would love to see that at Water Street, but the first thing would be to get it remediated. Thank you. Now, let's turn our attention to the Fin Dam. Thank you for being patient. And I'm going to start with you, candidate Morgan. Um, do you support or oppose removing the dam? And, and why or why not? Well, uh, thank you so much for that question. It was three uh, actually positions. One was to remove it, one was to keep it and refurbish it, and one was to keep it, one was to totally remove it, one was to keep it in its natural state, and one to keep it and refurbish it. I voted to remove it. Public record. Um, when it comes to the paper mill, um, what it offered is um, the dam has a use. Um, we're talking about home, we're talking about the natural environment. And when you're presented with a 500 uh, report from those who are pro keeping the dam, and 500 report from those who say removing, and another 500 report 
So you have to digest so much information from experts, from people who are ecologists and engineers. And um, but I think that just like a lot of things in the Jelania with the heritage and history we have, it's time to refurbish and to upgrade uh, some of these um, structures that we have. And I do think we have a, a credible team that we can work <laughs> with in our staff to find some developers to make something like a, a livery, a canoe, a um, place of water for the water walkway extension through the EMU. There's some ways that some cities can beautify that area as opposed to the way it was just where I think it's been over. Again, now, damn, I, I'm no uh, uh, engineer, but what it would take in the end to remove a, a, a construction, uh, a structure like that from its natural environment. Or, I just think something without disturbing the uh, environment um, that much, I do think is something better that the future lives. Thank you. Candid Brown? Yeah. Same question. So, you know, I took auditor with the dam after a lot of discussion, a lot of tense, very intense discussions um, from all sides. And one of the things that was really important was looking, looking to the future, of course. Um, our financial structure at this time, we really didn't, didn't have capacity to really maintain for a long period of time the upkeep of maintaining the dam as it stands. And to repair it, I mean, it, it was astronomical. Um, and so, you know, thinking about returning to vegetation and returning to greenery to utilize the river, um, I felt like that was the direction that we could move in. I mean, it is a draw within our community and we are not, we are not monopolizing on, on that opportunity. And also, when we think about just, you know, from an ecological standpoint, which I'm not to be colleges, but there were so many draws to opening that space up to widen up the river again, get water flowing through being able to canoe, use the water frontage rather than have a dam there that is damaged um, and could fail at any point in time. That danger in itself was really alarming to me. And again, there were a lot of folks who felt like we could, we could fix it, we could repair it. And I respect the points of view, but when I think long-term, when I think about where we are and the immediate needs that we have, pouring money into fixing the dam was not top of mind for me when we need to be looking at water school, we need to be looking at additional housing, when we look at violence interruption, right? So putting money into the dam was not a priority for me at this time. Now, I'm always open to be corrected, if something happens and there's a way to do that, I don't foresee that being in our future. And so I stand behind making the decision to vote to remove it at this time. Thank you. Candidate Allen, what you say? My vote was to uh, repair the dam. At that particular time when that vote was before us, and I sat in on meetings with the, um, with the group of people uh, that are, were particularly supporting the, the dam, and I sat in and heard all on the other side also. But did that, to repair the dam at that time, it would have cost $800,000. And the dam was not in bad shape. It was in, they considered it in fair, repairable shape at $800,000 and that the dam would have many more lives to it. There was also the possibility if the dam is repaired to actually, um, refurbishing it so that it produces electricity. And if it is repaired and uh, refurbished so that it reduces that electricity, if there can produce enough electricity to supply 400 um, homes with hydro power, which if we're looking at the, the climate and the uh, ecosystem, that would certainly uh, be a plus. Um, I am definitely concerned. Some of the reports, and I've had privy to some reports that were done recently, and they don't know, they've gone just down so far, and they said they found that, you know, they found a little bit of stuff there, kind of like the water street, mm -hmm. they found a little bit of stuff, but once you take that dam out, there was a paper mill there. We don't know what all silk has settled there down deeper and what trouble it will cause for the Ford Lake. I hate to see Ford Lake contaminated. And uh, not only that, but um, there's the bridge. There is the train bridge that goes over there. And we would ne definitely have to redo that. <clears throat> to pull that dam out, it started out at three, the city would have to cost the city uh, three million. It now, for the total, the look at pulling it all out is up past $5 million. 
So 800,000 to prepare, 5 million to take it out. And you don't know what you're gonna find. Thank you. So whether, no matter what side you're on, on the debate, a lot of, lot of time and energy and effort has gone into you all and, and your colleagues investigating that matter. And so I'm sure the citizens are appreciative of that. Here's a question, and a candidate Morgan, I'm going to start with you. If, because I believe you mentioned, um, you know, with the removal of the dam, then you could have some kind of leisure activities or maybe, you know, some other type of things going on. So with that in mind, if you do start to pursue those types of leisure activities, how will the city regulate those funding, those activities to making sure that it is, you know, being used and enjoyed by the citizens of Ypsilanti and not just, you know, taken advantage of by others in neighboring areas? Well, that's, that's a great question. And so we think about our parks and recs in general, that would be probably added to our parks and recs. The goal is still to get some of our facilities up in that functional and average shape, or get our bathrooms up working. And so when you think about people you interfacing with what we have, like um, our bathrooms, our parks, and perhaps, uh, like I said, the new delivery, how can we, we want people to come in and enjoy um, the things that we have to offer. But again, if we're talking about downstream here on, who would have buy-in in Mickey County, perhaps uh, Ann Arbor, maybe a sister city, um, but again, regulating, um, that's, that's a constant thing we're talking about enforcement. And, uh, and that's a money stream, but then how it rolls out. And just because we uh, want something to happen, it's just one thing, but who it affects. And again, um, we may have a joint delivery on, on Water Street, but we're talking about potential things right now. We're talking about the future. And so uh, the, the, the worst deal is a deal that can't be uh, worked upon. And so I, I'm not, I, I like to believe that getting many people to the table to get some of these answers together, but we want to know that, uh, we want to know that, yes, we want you to interface with what we have, the best of what she has to offer. However, uh, we don't want them to take advantage of it and again, utilize it more than our citizens. And so those are just um, having public meetings and finding out how we can get by in from you. Sure, and what you mentioned is, you know, some of the, the unintended or intended consequences of, of actions. And, and it is important to kind of get all the people to the table and figure out uh, the next steps. Same question for you, Candidate Brown. Yeah, um, one of my council goals this year had been to restructure and develop our parks and recs department. Um, we don't currently have um, again, the revenue to revamp it in the way that it, it once was, but our DPW department, DPS, is doing a phenomenal job of maintaining our parks um, and, and making sure that it is clean and accessible um, to, our, to our community. I think that spaces that are communal, it's okay for it to be utilized by the broader community, not just, you know, the home community, as long as there is ability for us to be able to have access. So when you talk about like code enforcement and fees, maybe that is a step in the right direction to figure out, you know, like how you have park passes, right? So if you are a resident, then maybe you have a lower fee to rent a space there than someone who is external to the city. Um, there's, there's different mechanisms that you can put in place, but I think it'll be an interplay of a lot of things. I think that we also have to make sure that we set aside funds just in general for our parks, we do have a small park fund that we've been utilizing that was established by um, our previous council member who was in love with parks. And so we, we need to build that funding source up to make sure that we can properly maintain the space in general to make sure people want to come there at all. You know, um, and I think just opportunities for communal spaces are going to be important. I wouldn't want to shut anyone out, but making sure that we are going to be renting spaces or having people have to reserve the spaces, that there are maybe different mechanisms for those who live here versus those who don't, to make sure that access is available to the people who live here first. And then, of course, feel free to come and join us if you would like to from outside of our, you know, media. Thank you. Kennedy Alice Richardson. One of the things that I really like about the parks and it's the landing and uh, we, over the last few years, we have really worked to, to build our parks up and to, to clean them up. Um, and I am so proud of um, Park Ridge Park. We had a men's group, and um, Mr. Bridges was part of that men's group that took over Park Ridge Park and made it their own and really uh, made it, brought it up. And it, it's still a very nice park. One of the things that I really like about our parks is that our parks are open and free to everyone. You know, and basically what we ask is 
Use the power, but respect the power. Don't destroy it. Come in, use it, clean up after yourself, and leave it so that someone else can come in and use it. I drive by the parks in um, Ipsy Township, and they're gated, or you have to pay to get in. Um, Loon Feather Park, it used to be open where you could go in. I used to love to go and sit down by, on the dock down there by the water. But now you have to pay to go in to sit down by the water. And I'm not going to be there that long, you know, to pay $5 to get in. So I would like to see our park stay open and free to whoever want. Come in, use the park, respect the park, clean up after yourself so that somebody else can come in. Thank you. I'm going to stay with you for a second, and we're going to change topics. Um, you mentioned you mentioned with the pandemic um, the electrical uh, feature hydropower. Thank you, and it made me think about a question that someone asked about um, like in the in the spirit of like climate and responsible climate and, and electrical energy if you will and the question is what is your view because there well let me preface there's a charging station um, for electrical cars on ellsworth in the parking lot or over there where the old walmart used to be and so one what is your view on the um, the chart those charging stations and two should we expand or your what are your thoughts on expanding electric charging stations and three should the residents of Ypsilanti receive rebates or credits if they are using such stations? So it's a three-part question. Okay, yes. Um, really, pretty much to all three of them. Okay. Because number one, people have electrical cars. And we that can still drive a gas rent car. We have to have a gas station to go refill. Electrical cars also need to be charged. And so people need places to charge them. And if we're really looking at becoming, um, cleaning up the, the climate and cleaning up our environment, we all should maybe possibly be looking towards moving towards electrical vehicles because they are much cleaner. So yes, we do. And I think that we need, um, possibly more charging stations. And I know that was one of the uh, things that we talked very, very briefly about during our goal setting sessions was about charging stations. Um, yes, if they're going to be, uh, if it's not a private charging station, if it's owned and operated by the city, yes, the city should get money from that. Thank you. Canada Brown, same, same three, I can repeat them. I know I gave like more stations. Yeah, yeah. Your thoughts on the charging stations? Should we expand them? If and should citizens receive rebates or credits? Okay. Yes, we should expand them because more and more individuals are purchasing um, you know, vehicles that require charging. So we should have additional charging stations. Um, I think that to me, that's a really great tie into um, developing new spaces to make sure that's incorporated in whatever plan that is, um, along with, you know, um, solar, right? We, in Ipsy, we've gotten awards for the amount of solar that we have in our community. So we are, we are a community moving toward sustainability every day, more and more. Um, I think that rebates absolutely should be offered. It's the same as when you put solar on your home and you get replaced with BTE or your, and also you get, there's a mutual benefit to your BTE bill going down as well, right? So absolutely, if you are, um, you know, providing an opportunity for increased sustainability, then yes, you should get something for that because you are not burning a gas, burning a vehicle. Um, I think another piece of this is too, that as we're thinking about like, you know, electric vehicles, we have to think about walkability. I don't wanna, I don't want to have conversations that, you know, like block out folks who bike, who walk, um, because that's a piece that seems to be forgotten in a city that, you know, in a town that is built on the auto industry. Um, and so I do think that opportunities for folks to have additional charging stations, yes. I think I saw your questions, mm -hmm. rebates, yes. Um, and I do support um, electric vehicles within this community, but I also support walkability and bikeability too. 
very interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing. Candidate Morgan. I would echo what the panelists said. Um, I don't know the, uh, the market for electric cars or how many, uh, like one per, like one, per one electric vehicle, two gas. I don't know how the future is going to um, roll out, but I do believe uh, being in, uh, in the state of Michigan where gas cars is in the uh, model, but I learned from it. Um, but locally here, uh, I do think, uh, the, I don't know how much energy one of those stations take or require, but um, I do think the more, it should be synonymous with the amount of cars that are shown. As far as rebates, again, like uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Brown had mentioned, uh, the solar, I think anything that uh, reduces uh, carbon footprints, anything that increases sustainability and green uh, should be uh, should be rewarded for it. You know, and that's the, uh, it should be rewarded for it. But I do believe I would follow the lead of our sustainability commission, who they come up with great ideas and very research, very informational of things that they bring to council to help us make decisions like this. So um, yes, I would agree that I would support Thank you. And Candidate Morgan, I'm going to stick with you because you mentioned something about, um, you talked about the heritage and the history of Ypsilanti earlier uh, during an earlier discussion point. And so uh, should you become mayor of Ypsilanti, what, and I know there are already plans in place for the Ypsilanti Bicentennial, but should you become mayor of Ypsilanti, what can we see different new what tell us about tell us what you would like to see? Well, I'd like to see a bigger vision for this. Okay. Um, my platform is Ipsilanti 2034, which is a 15 year uh, plan from 2009 to 2024 that I created after doing uh, a research project about Willow Run from 2003 to 2018. Show how we were absorbed and, uh, and how it, um, to better transform the vision for the city. So, in that, I know in the last. Uh, According to the Ypsilanti City eight percent, we have a, a decrease in population of Blacks by eight percent here in our city. Um, so we want to create a plan on how to increase the person. Um, my colleagues have a thirty-year combined efforts on city council, and so me being new-ish um, on the platform of politics, the goal is to follow up with some of the things they help usher in, use a vision for our city to. See further, and I think um, when we come about the Washington County 2030 plan, the Ypsilanti Township 2040 plan, it's parts of this county that wants to see a region move. And I think uh, since we're the little sister in the county, and I do think uh, since a lot of the other uh, surrounding uh, rural areas uh, benefit from Ipsy, especially our workforce, some of our creativity, some of our, our citizens. And so I want this, uh, we pride here at diversity is the, the claim of the uh, the model of our city. And so to hold us accountable to that and show you what that looks like for the new face. So the same old model with a new look for the younger people who are coming up who want to be um, entrusted with sustaining this model of uh, property, of fellowship, of community. And so these things are like transferring the best of what we have to the young people. So that's one of my visions. Uh, again, I have a democracy I do with the Native American campaign. And I do is just a commitment to, uh, like, with the ring, is like being committed to uh, an ideal um, and staying consistent with that. And then the I do is that being active. So, using those principles to get people collectively together. So, I want a, um, a montage of uh, collectivity. That's what I would want to be. Commitment to the institution of Ypsilanti. Um, <laughs> I will send you a bill for that. <laughs> <laughs> Candidate Alvin Richardson, uh, same question. Thoughts, vision, plans uh, for the Ypsilanti Bicentennial. Wow. You know, uh, Bicentennial, that is 200 years. And Ypsilanti has come a long way. But Ypsilanti still has a long way to go. And one of the things that I would really like to see for the city is, and that I am working for towards now, is for us to really come to a place of unity. As he said, the, the motto for the city is pride, diversity, uh, and heritage. So let's really bring our heritage and work on diversity, you can have diversity. I got one thing over here, one thing over here, one thing here, and that's diversity when I bring them all together. But it doesn't help if one's still over here, one's over here, one's still in the middle. So my 
goal is to see the city come to a place of unity. There is so much that can be done when we work together. You know, you can work all day in your little place and I can work all day in my little place and we, you get a little bit done and I get a little bit done, but it's not touching the big problem. It's kind of like what I said when I uh, had the idea for bringing people together. Everybody was working and everybody was doing a fantastic job, but we still getting kids killed and we weren't, nobody was working and no one what the other one's doing so we could work. But when we join hands and work together, then we will see something happen. So that is one of the things that I really want to see. Uh, I want to see a change in our city. I want to see a, a, a real coming together, a coming together of black, brown, native people, all of us working together, all of us, if we're going to live here, let's truly embrace each other, embrace our, our diversity so that we are one and so that we can show the world, hey, we can live together. And I would love to see woo back a number of Black people into the city, those that have left, some because they didn't feel uh, comfortable, some just because they couldn't afford here. But I would love to see it so that everybody that wanted to live in the city of Ypsilanti could afford to live here. Not everybody living at the same, you know, the houses. And one of the things about the affordable housing, when I mentioned before, if somebody that's built, living in a medium income house moves into an upper level income house, the person that's down here in affordable, they can move into that medium. You know, so it's a constantly moving up, but we're all working and helping one another coming together. We're all better together. We're all better when all are better. Your um, theme of unity goes back, and you said this to the earlier statement about reducing silos to help with the reducing violence. So it's something that, um, you know, I can tell just in your remarks that you were very passionate about. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Candidate Brown. Yes, thank you. So, you know, I think the first thing that I'll say is when we talk about diversity, a lot of times folks actually are talking about equality, and I like to talk about equity. Um, you know, we have to name it when we're talking about diversity. So it's not just race. It's with our LGBTQ plus, our, you know, community. It's with our trans and queer communities. It's with women as a marginalized group, right? It's with black men as a targeted population. We have to look at all of this. It's the grand scope. So, you know, when we're looking at Bicentennial, one of the things that I've thought about that is amazing that we've already moved to, and I don't think even folks have noticed what it's doing is, you know, we renamed a part of Washington Street, Black Lives Matter Boulevard, Ottawa. And there was some feedback about where that name should have actually gone. It should have gone on the south side is what, you know, some, some constituents have said. And some of the feedback that I gave in those conversations was, I disagree. The history of the south side, it exists, it's there. We need to be shouting that out, <coughs> shouting that out often and, and, and loudly and proudly, but also, Black people have history throughout this entire city, and so we need to be placing things in those areas that really magnify the fact that we have contributed to this entire space, not just one side of Michigan Ave. And so I think like along those lines, we're talking about what I want to see in the future of Ypsilanti. I want to see a, a future of Ypsilanti where we acknowledge folks in all spaces and the contributions that they make in all of those spaces, because no one person or no one demographic brought us to the point that we're at today. You know, and I think that it's, it's difficult, you know, when I hear folks talking about the South Side and the Black community and Black flight, I absolutely want to bring Black people back into this community. But I also think that we have to be mindful of the way that we talk about um, diversity and that we're naming diversity as a whole and not just based on racial equity, but social equity and all these different marginalized communities that we have within Ypsilanti. That is the beauty of Ypsilanti. That is what draws people in, the wide array of folks that we see here. And so my work would be to uplift and bring those folks together, you know, some cohesion around that so that we are not siloed into our affinity spaces, that we are working together to make sure that everybody is shared education about the contributions of different groups um, within this community. So that is definitely one of my goals, one of my passion projects. Equity is like top tier. Yeah, thank you. And I'm hearing that your, your vision of equity is um, very, not to say anyone else's is it, right. but you know, but you're mentioning 
um, a more broader continuum of inclusiveness um, as you are thinking about your bicentennial plans for the city. So thank you for that. Um, there was a question from a member of the audience here, and uh, it's to all candidates. I'm going to start with you, Candidate Brown. And it says, um, what are some of your plans to address racial equality in the city of Ypsilanti? Candidate Morgan. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, the question is, the, uh, what's the country doing to create racial equality in the country? And uh, then what are they doing in the state? So we can see models too, that we can actually utilize on a local level. Um, and if we don't plan for it, we won't see it. So for me, um, I, I think what uh, Mayor Portem just mentioned, when we're thinking about community, individual communities, whether it's the uh, disabled community, whether it's the youth community, whether it's uh, the elderly community. Um, this is a long-standing historical issue that I think is really multifaceted. And so again, um, being the person that, uh, and again, it's personal to me, being someone um, who's represented, who's in an underserved, marginalized group. Uh, so it, it always hits me different. Um, so I wonder, what can we do? What can we do when we think about uh, Blacks and indigenous people only less than 5% of the city. What can we do about certain groups being at the bottom of every industry, whether it's education, political, military, agriculture, um, politics, in every facet? So, what are we doing, right? So, we recognize, we recognize these actualities. So, what can we do to offset this major? So, I think the first thing is um, just having a human level uh, understanding of uh, it can't exist this way without some systemic or systematic way of allowing it to happen. Um, wishing it was uh, based on our work ethic or our intelligence or our creativity. So we think about racial dynamics. Um, some core issues that uh, people are going to have to get real with. So I'm just open for more dialogue. I'm definitely open for more understanding and, and just have different perspectives on this unique plight. I think, uh, again, uh, women's issues and transgender, every plight is unique. And some are longstanding when we think about um, Again, uh, white supremacy being the biggest threat to the national stage, whether it's NSA, FBI, CIA, they, these things are known. And it's the same thing that trickles down statewide and locally. So these things are not in the silo or in the vacuum. They're, they're, not, they're not mutually exclusive on the local level. So the goal is to, uh, again, have uh, indigenous, brown, and people in, in um, vulnerable groups to be um, this conscious of their plight and having other people be fair and conscious of our plight with more conversation. Thank you. Same question. Question. Anybody else interested? Um, yes, I have been. I'm going to ask that question on another uh, survey that I was having. I have been fighting for racial equality all my life. I remember even um, at I think it was probably about ten years old. Happened to be. Uh, on vacation in Alabama, and we, uh, my cousin took one, the friend that I had to for us to go buy souvenirs. And in going to buy, we were standing there, and we had done the shopping like she told us, go in and get the the counter. And these two ladies were standing at the other end, the salespeople, and they wouldn't come and wait on us. And I was like, you know, dishing and whatnot, and I'm okay because i know my cousin's waiting and i said you know why don't they they see us here you know say it to the girl and she's you know kind of drawn up and she you know my cousin came in and she said well what's taking you all so i said because them two old bitty standing down there talking and she goes hush your mouth hush your mouth hush your mouth you know and then when we went to the show we had to go around to the back and upstairs and the, the color and, the, and i remember coming back that changed me. Something happened on the inside of me, and that's wrong. And I and I just began. I was in the youth NAACP and, and other youth groups that were fighting, and, and that church youth groups that were were moving towards, you know, and talking about racial equality. And I remember race was an issue here in the city of Ypsilanti, and. It's in the roots, and anything that's in the roots, until you get it out of the root, it's gonna 
pop up every now and then. You can dig dandelions up out of your yard, but if you don't get all the root, guess what? It's going to pop right back up. You say, I just dug that up. Well, so I believe, and I believe to the unity that I want to bring or work towards bringing in the city will help us work on that root of racism so that we can have true racial equality here in the city of Atlanta. Because I see racism raise up its ugly head every now and then right here in the good old city of Atlanta. And it's got to be cut off. We've got to get all of that root out of there. And it's going to come when we all work together. When, when all of us, the black and the white, we see it that, you know, hey, it's there and we cannot stand it. We've got to do something about it. Candidate Brown. I got it right this time. <laughs> um, well, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is I believe in reparations. So I think that that's an important thing that, as an elected official, no matter on what level, to advocate for, right? Um, other communities have received their forms of reparations, and we deserve it too. Um, I think. In, in our own way within the city, what we can do is to continue to pour resources back into these marginalized communities. And so, you know, we have to look at our budget. We have to make sure that, you know, we are fiscally responsible, but we also have to be sure that we're giving money to the spaces that really need them and not just giving them out equally. Because again, we seem to lean into equality rather than equity. Equity means those who need it need to have it, right? It doesn't mean that because Anthony wants something that I should get it too. I may not need that thing. Um, and so, you know, we have to teach people, educate folks. Education is a theme in a lot of what, you know, I've been talking about at my time on council around their implicit biases, you know, that what we assume when we see someone. Um, we have to bring folks together. Again, ideas like the rec center, like an unarmed, you know, press intervention team. These are all opportunities for us to infiltrate the community together and work side by side to support everyone, not just one part of the community. We do need to put our attention into the spaces that need it most. Um, and that is our young people, and particularly our young people of color. Um, I think that another piece of it is, I really want to model the idea of what it means to call someone in rather than call someone out. Um, I think that we do a lot of that. Cancel culture is huge in this day and age. Um, and so, you know, the practice of calling someone in is really, really important that it doesn't mean that I am down at you or I'm criticizing you by correcting you or, or giving you a different way of thinking about something. And so I think for me, as a leader, currently, not even thinking about this seat, which I would humbly serve and do the same things, is just to lead in a sense of with, with educating folks, right? To model the behaviors we want to see and let that trickle down, you know, throughout everyone else that we touch. Okay. Your uh, comment about equal makes me think of my grandmother, and she would always tell us growing up, I treat you all, I don't give you all the same thing, I give you all what you need in order to be successful. That doesn't mean you get the same thing, so it makes me, makes me think about that. Um, I want to say you all are doing great. We are almost over. <laughs> We're almost done here. Um, we have two more things. I'm going to go into a theme of, or topic of um, community partnerships. And then I'm going to circle back to safety. We're going to end with safety because there's a, a, a question that came in that I want to make sure I get to. So, Can I share something just before we go? Yeah. Uh, I, I know uh, Neil Protect Brown has been talking a lot about equity, and equity is high on my list too. I've done a lot of work around that on the state level. But my definition of equity. I absolutely love it. And it wasn't one that, it wasn't original with me. I got it from someone, a young man. And he explained equity and equality is everyone has a pair of shoes. And equity is everyone has a pair of shoes that fit. And if you've ever had a pair of shoes that were too tight, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to community partnerships. This is a question that came from a colleague of mine. Um, they mentioned that currently, through the CARES Act, um, it's currently falling on Ypsilanti schools, Ypsilanti Community School District, to provide summer resources and activities in the summer to students. But that funding is drying up. And they want to know 
about city resources for youth in the summer? And how would you, as if you were mayor of Ypsilanti, Ypsilanti, how would you make up for the shortfall? So to summarize, how would you, as mayor of Ypsilanti, make up for city resources for youth in the summer? And I cannot remember where I left off that, so I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. No problem. Candidate for now. Thank you. So um, actually, that's something that has been top of mind with me, with me um, in both of my terms on council. So one of the things that I was able to partner with our, our previous mayor to start was a mini grant program for young people and young youth survey agencies that are 501c3 within the communities. So the city, we do not provide direct programming. We don't have a parks and rec department currently that can, that can do that. Um, but what we can do is pour resources into those who are already doing that. And so we have set up the whole application process where you go on our website, you fill out the application, it's really easy, quick few questions, give us your 501c3 status and apply for funds up to $5,000 to fund programming directly that impacts young people. Um, so that's, that's one thing, it's already in place, they go on the website right now and apply for that link. Um, and we put $25,000 aside for the past few years um, to go into that, that mini grant program. Um, I I said that. The other thing that I think that, that we could do is making sure that, oh, yes, in goal setting, we're trying to recreate the parks and <coughs> department. One of the things that came back was, okay, we can't afford to do that, but what can we do? And one of my suggestions was, well, what we could do is reach out to the community, people who are doing things, and at least put their events on our shared calendar so there's a landing space for folks to come to at the city to see what everyone else is doing across the city. Um, because we realized that things were happening in silos. There were different agencies who were doing maybe some of the same programming that people didn't know or had more capacity or had less people showing up over here, but more folks showing up over here. And so because we don't have capacity to run programming at this point in time, I think it's our job to be the conduit, right? To make sure that people are bringing information to us and then we can spread that information out. So within our means, pour resources into the community, into programming, into you know the work program center, into these mini grants, and then also be the hub for folks to be able to come and find out what's happening in the greater community because we know that it's not happening in a smooth, cohesive way right now. Thank you. Candidate Warden, same question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there was a time uh, when I worked um, for Ypsilanti Public Schools and Ann Arbor Public Schools, but when Ann Arbor Public Schools offered 119 extracurricular activities to the city of Ypsilanti schools, only offered 21. And it was a very big gap. And this is during the school we're talking about. And we're talking about summer now. And we, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was partnering with YPL and the Ozone House, the Pride Zone, where I DJ the um, LGBTQ, part, uh, LGB, LGBTQ party, um, which was, um, it was a time where mentor youth would sponsor some programs. Community Park Ridge uh, has its other program, um, uh, the Cream. So it's different organizations. So we were like piecemealing things for young people to do in the city. Um, but as far as, uh, and there was an initiative to, to donate $25,000 to their sports and arts program. So it's gonna take a collective. Um, to, it's a gap that's, that's, that's forming that we have to fill the gaps. You know? So and then we won't take just one program or just one lump sum annually. It's, 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 it's a, and it went, from the last question, it's a core thing uh, when it comes to education and what's missing. So, and although there's a lot of groups attempting to um, fill the gap, but it takes a uh, collaboration so that we do with the word. Um, where we have community records, where you have a YDL doing some of your program. And so some of these things, uh, as, as uh, Mayor Brooks had mentioned, having them uh, all streamlined to one place, and I think it would appear that we have uh, a lot more because people know about it. But um, we have some gaps to fill, and uh, I think uh, again, it's going to take a lot more conversation and grants and collective work to continue. Thank you. Candidate Allen Richardson. Oh, yes. The children that go to YCS schools. They are ours. They're not all from the city, but they, they, the, our children in the city go. And so I feel that we have a responsibility to do whatever we can to help our children. If they're in YCS or wherever, but particularly YCS because that is where most of our children go. So I believe that uh, the city and I have put forth that uh, we need to 
for our offer money. We have not used it yet. But I have put forth that we need to take some of our ARPA money and use it for our children. The county uh, started a program where they set up bank accounts, money set aside for children in schools in the county to open up a bank account. And it has been proven that children that have a bank account, regardless of how much money it, it is in there, is something that about having that, that moves them on towards graduation. And anything that's going to move our children on towards graduation, I'm for assisting. And I believe that that would be, I would love to see us take some powerful money for that. I do believe that we, and I have been in conversation with uh, school board members and also with the superintendent, but how can we work together? What can we do? And the city does not just have a rolling amounts of money, but certainly there's some other things that we could possibly do to help the school uh, YCS to become uh, more in a better place. Uh, one of the things that we can do, and I say this out to everybody that's listening on Facebook, everyone that lives in the city of Ypsilanti or everyone that has a child in YCS, we should be knocking on the door in Lansing saying, Wipe out their debt. It was criminal for them, the state, to bring two bankrupt, almost bankrupt school systems together and expect them to flourish without taking away their debt. So that's one of the things that we really need to be doing. All of us need to be knocking on that door. And you mentioned the um, statistics behind uh, students who have um, savings accounts or bank accounts or what have you and their um, college matriculation rate, would you propose that all YCS students be eligible for that type of type of service even if they aren't YCS residents? I would suggest that, no, I propose that the, there's approximately 3,000 um, Ipsy students in YCS, that was last year, that we uh, put a small deposit in each one of their accounts. The county has started them, but that we put a deposit in their account. Okay. Not for all, no, we can't do it for all of their uh, students, but for those that are from Ipsy, because they're our kids. Okay. Thank you. There is a public question, and the person wants to ask the question themselves. Do we have a microphone? <clears throat> I um, just want to say first off, you know, thank you all for coming out and just giving us, you know, lots of information and feedback. The personal is great. And um, you've got a lot of wonderful ideas and things. Um, going to some, there was some mention about the program that was called Democracy I Do. And it also reminded me of something that Candidate Richardson so talked about and saying that part of the problem with the um, the gun range that, that came to the community was that there wasn't enough participation for people to put their voice out and to, you know, prevent those types of things that are happening without there being enough discussion about that. So um, my question to the candidates are, what are some things that you are looking forward to doing? What would you do to increase the participation for our residents in terms of local government so that their voices can be heard. Um, there's there's youth, there's many different populations that are that are included within that. What are some of the things that you look forward to doing um, further, you know, if you are elected? Yes. Um, I just bring a question and you know there's so many things there. So there's the typical things, you know, town halls, inviting people to council, you know, that kind of thing, list serves. Um, but I think we have to galvanize some action and some movement. And so I would surely do all those things, right? And have some coffee hours, calling, texting, we'll do it now already. But something that actually just recently happened, um, and it shows the power of, you know, getting out and, you know, really gathering folks together is that after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, some of us were sitting together and were like really just concerned about what 
what had just happened. And we decided that we were just going to plan a rally the next morning because, you know, typically those things don't really happen when they, they want to come to Ann Arbor. Um, and in less than 72 hours, I think they said we had almost 300 people show up at Frog Island Park just to come and hear about what they could do to get involved, to help push back, and to, to support reproductive freedom for all. So we had folks come out and sign petitions. We had folks come out with their signs. Some community members after that were so fired up that they started their own march that left out of the park and went through Depot Town. And so I think those are some of the mechanisms is to like just really cultivate people's energy um, and, and keep them in the loop. So of course, using social media, we use Facebook, Instagram, you know, TikTok, all these new things that the young people use. I mean, I'm pretty young, but I don't even use TikTok like that, but I have had to in this time frame. Um, just to really cultivate that and bring people to the table. We have to meet them where they are. We don't have a local newspaper um, at this point in time. MLI does a, a decent job of you know, covering us, but they're not with us in every space. They're not even here today covering us every day, right? And so we have to reach out and also share our good news out and not just you know, be picked up when there's bad news happening in the community. We saw how everything that happened in Township on Tuesday spread like wildfire. We need an opportunity to be able to share our good news too. And so it's going to take all those mechanisms, knocking on doors, walking with the community, talking to people, inviting them to council, sending them the links so they can watch it on Zoom. It's going to take a plethora of, there's not one answer, I guess, to what I'm giving. You have to be willing to put in the energy and the work to do, to do it all, and maybe it bring people in and help you do that and spread the message. Um, candidate Alan Richardson. Okay. Um, I just want to continue doing what I have been doing and that is reaching out and drawing people in. Um, I before the pandemic I was having uh, town halls where people actually and I would go and pull out people and I would most of the time when I had a town hall I would get a fair number of people that would come out. I would, and then during the pandemic, I had uh, some uh, Zoom town halls, but I would go to them, basically I would go to the people as I've been going to them and still er encouraging them, informing them, but also encouraging them to get active in the community, uh, continue reaching out to uh, community groups and asking them and other community uh, grassroots leaders, encourage the people that are working with you and informing them of what's going on. And um, of course, the social media also. But people, in working with people over the years, it's been very interesting. Uh, in the organizing work that I've done, it's actually going out and the knocking on the doors or the with the bringing people together that is the thing. And so sometimes you can bring them together in places that are not right there at City Hall, but getting them informed. I work with uh, the Neighborhood Association and continue to ask them to, you know, uh, we work together and their flyers are passed out. So it's just, it's just an ongoing, as an organizer, you learn that you can't stop. Just got to keep going. You got to keep reaching out, and so I would do that because I really understand we're all better when we're all we're all better. Thank you, candidate. So we Morgan. have to work together. Thank you, candidate Morgan. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for the question. Um, in a nutshell, I think uh, I want my ideas to be as diverse as the people I'm seeking to serve. So we have to have a combination of things. These are some actual things that's going on with the democracy I do campaign. Um, on Mondays, we do business visit Mondays where the goal is to get around the city and just to talk about some of the issues that the business owners are having. Um, that's been really you know, fruitful. Tuesday uh, before I resigned, council was the, the, the major outlet for what's going on with city business. On Wednesday, I do school days where you just visit schools from K-12, even the colleges, just to get uh, excited about civic engagement. Um, just from top down, just for young people to understand what participation is, civic uh, um, participation in government. Um, Thursday is to do this thing called on a commission where we want people to realize and understand how commissions work, uh, put some time in to talk about some of these difficult issues and uh, how they come to decisions and consensus. But we talk about gerrymandering 
and redistricting and things that affect every citizen. On Fridays, I go out and about. It means I may take my daughters or my wife and go out and, and, and parlay in places to be able to um, to, uh, to join, to, to be an everyday citizen. Uh, I think they need to see our representatives out in, in the city and be present to see that we uh, enjoy the city just as much as they do. Um, Saturday, we do some cleanups, but Sunday, I, I run with a group of citizens called Running for Office at uh, Prospect Park. But the three things I'm most power, proud of is the Power Moves 18, and that's an initiative to sign up 1,018 to 21 year olds to vote. Um, we've got about 312 so far, but we want the young people to be able to have some say in this uh, election cycle. Um, and then we have this thing I, I was ignorant to, but it's called a, a grand project where the goal is to support grandparents of support grandparents who take care of their children's children, whether uh, due to incarceration, death, sickness, or other extenuating circumstances. There's a lot of grandparents in our city caring for their grandchildren. And, and so it's a wonderful name, Benita Robinson, who's helping me do that. But these are just uh, actual things that are in the works that we're actually doing from now until we uh, primarily are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. There is one more comment or question from the audience. Everybody, I want to thank you for coming out. Y'all know my name, Tyrone Bridges. I want to correct the record real quick. The only show will cover this event, this candidate forum, is I Thought You Knew. We would like to thank you for answering our invitations. We would like to thank you for coming and giving your time on your busy schedule and sharing with us. You're on live still, and also thank you from the viewers. I have two quick questions for myself. You know, I'm an Ipsy Township resident, but my blood bleeds in Ipsy Land, Fire Hospital Bay. What is it? that city council and the mayor currently knows about the cameras, the license plates surveillance program that's kicking off in Ipswich townships, that's covering a very large vicinity, including Superior Township, the city of Ipswich, and also Ipsy Township. That's my first question. I'm going to take a pause and we'll come back to the mic. I think that is a very important question for every candidate. And Mr. Bridges, I missed part of that. What does city council and the mayor know? What, what does the city council and the mayor know about the license plates reader program? that the Ypsilanti Township is starting that they will have over 60 cameras in a certain mile radius that will read every license plate that come through. You will have a, literally, you will have a DNA on your car. Every time you ride by, it will know everything about you. So candidate Alan Richardson, I'm gonna start with you. Well, okay. okay. Um, I don't know a lot about the program. I've heard about the them putting up the cameras in the township. I know that uh, we just, I worked with a group that we were, uh, we just addressed the Ypsilanti police about stopping cars after looking at the, the license plates and seeing that there was no insurance. And we, um, the group that I work with uh, out of We Rock, we approached them and asked them to stop. And we got a um, a letter from the, a, a commitment from the chief. And he forwarded to us a an email that he had sent the officers that they were not to uh, ticket anyone or stop anyone because they did not have insurance. Because there's a, a lag sometime in how uh, when the insurance is actually put up there. I have heard about that the township was going to do what you're saying, but I don't know any details about it. Let me real quick toss this in here. Wait. Okay. I would like to give each of the candidates the opportunity to respond. Okay. okay. Candidate Brown. Um, yeah, so I don't believe we were included in that conversation. 
with them because it does, they may not have believed that it was going to impact us. It's their budget, you know, their perimeter. What I will say is, because we were not at the table, if I can tell you that, um, I was at least, um, is that I don't think they may have thought through the unintentional consequences that come um, from that type of surveillance, especially because the city sits in the middle of all of that. So that means anyone coming into the city is going to bypass those cameras, coming to live, do work, play, leisure in the city of Ypsilanti. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information on the decision making that the township made about that. Um, but what I do know is it's going to impact the city regardless because we are sitting in the center of all of that and we traverse each of well, we're in the township right now, right? I live in the city. I've driven past a camera if that, if that were up uh, already, correct. So um, with, with that, the other piece I was going to add on to is that, um, you know, since uh, Mr. Morgan is no longer on council, I have become the liaison to the Islamic Police Advisory Commission. And in my first meeting, which was just last Thursday, the uh, topic that the mayor was just talking about with that email was actually something that we decided in that space then. We had a presentation from We Rock, and um, we talked about it with the chief and with the members of that commission. And it was by my request and the request of the body at that time that he send that information out to the officers, even though there was not data to state that we were actually committing those type of stops. Um, but the importance of reiterating the conversation was top tier. And so within 24 hours, that email went out and it was forwarded to everyone who's a part of that group. But again, it's about jumping on things immediately and addressing them. Um, again, we were not we were not a part of the conversation with the council's decision. So I cannot speak to the type of cameras or what their dialogue was, but there are unintended consequences, and I'm hoping that they had thought of those uh, prior to making their decision. Thank you. Candidate Morgan? Thank you. I was um, the liaison to YPAC for three years and seven months, so I'm still uh, having the uh, opportunity to sit in some of the meetings where the chief would uh, go over very important vital statistics. But um, And as we talked about the actual um, license plate the readers and the shot detectors and what they are, Capabilities, what their intentions are versus the actuality, and the shots detectors can locate shots up to 20 yards. So, we want to believe that these uh, technological advances are to increase safety, right? And we want to believe that they're here to uh, monitor neighborhoods for positive. But, but again, um, where they're put, um, where they're placed, we're talking about the criteria, the location. But I challenged the, um, the police chief at the time about, I challenged um, uh, Chief Juicy about. When the readers are being read, that's creating a, a, knowing, a knowing database for our citizens. How long is that being captured? And, and the response was, it, it's an unknown amount of time that basically this, it's not meant to be a database, but this being it's a database anyway, every time we capture. So we don't really know the uh, true nature of the capabilities of the technology and how it's going to roll out and what's going to be most affected by it. But clearly, um, some people feel that where they're being located, has a, a underlying um, suggestion that where crime is is where certain individuals live, and so um, it's still going to be up in there. Not as far as the township being in proximity to the city, these conversations are going to happen there, here, in Arbor, and everywhere. So we just, um, however they handle them, we should, we should learn from. Thank you. You had a second question. Last, last question. There was a there was a call to I thought you did by a teacher of a young girl, a young 11-year-old girl that was missing in the city of Chilean. She called begging, begging and pleading for us to help find this child. After the lady and another lady in the background had the conversation with us, we were about to air about the child and they actually called us back and told us that the child was found. She was found in the middle of the street, dropped off like a piece of trash. This child was disabled, a Ypsilanti resident, and we have heard zero from the police chief or the city police department about this situation. Once again, let's say the age, 11 year old disabled child, 11, she was raped. 
She was held hostage. And no one can tell me it didn't happen because they called our show. We had to record it. My question to the candidates, when you become mayor, what would you do different with the leader of the Ypsilanti Police Department, AKA the Chief of Police, Tony JC, in that situation? We haven't heard anything about it. No suspect has been found. A little black child, disabled, was not hurt. Candidate for Morgan. Thank you for that. That's very graphic, uh, sad situation. Um, I'm not a detective and I don't play one on TV. Uh, we think about real time actions and real time information. Um, and, and again, Things happen on M, uh, on M, things happen on uh, Facebook Live that gets to the fashion that it would on M Live. Um, we think about facts, we think about um, investigation of what's happening and how information that is so uh, emotionally jarring should be rolled out. I know some people like myself, some journalists want to believe that the truth is ultimate, but we've got to be careful of what we do with the truth and how we roll it out and how we protect the innocent and the victims. And so I'm not a cop and I'm not a, a not a detective, but uh, those are very sensitive situations. Um, they should be, um, again, we have a, just the, developed a communication director on how things are uh, that happen in the city should be. Because um, some information is sensitive, some is classified, some is top secret. And I, I, I don't profess to know what the police uh, chief comes across his desk and, and the information you get versus real time versus staggered information versus, because we get what I used to get, but they're privy to some information that come across. So, our, well, their desk, our desk at a certain time. So we have certain information, but some information that there's an investigation going, we're, we're not privy to certain information. Um, so as far as the situation at hand, um, when the facts came out, I think they should be delivered uh, tactfully and uh, in a way that people can understand it and more solution oriented on how we can prevent it again. Not just to, some information is just to jar and stir people without any uh, credible solutions at hand. And that was a very, very tragic thing that happened to that family and my heart goes out to Thank you. Candidate Alan Richardson. Um, Mr. Bridges, I heard about that, not at the time that it happened, but shortly, a few days, within a week after it happened. And I heard about it from the detective <clears throat> that was on that case. And as Mr. Morgan said, we don't always get everything that happens. There were, was another incident shortly after I be, first became mayor and it had happened two weeks before and I received a call from the director of the Salt Crisis Center asking me did I, why wasn't there a press release. Unfortunately, the, the chief of police was out of town. At that time, I did check with the city manager nor she had, she was not aware of that. I don't know that she was made aware of this incident until also after. It's a problem with the chief and his reporting to the city manager and mayor and council. And it has to change. It absolutely has to change. I was, my heart was hurt on both instances, because it happened to someone that was um, in our my ward, both incidents. And don't do that to me. You know, these are people that I might not know them, but I might know their family. Because Ypsilanti is a place where everybody knows everybody. And that is changing some now. But that's the way it was. And I I feel as outraged as you do. Thank you. Candidate Brown. Yeah. Um, as someone who works with young people every day, um, I work in community mental health. I work with young people who are differently abled. I work with young folks who have um, you know, mental health uh, discrepancies. It was definitely disheartening to hear about it. And we did not hear about it in real time. That, that is fact. What I can also agree with is that I am not a sworn police officer. I have never been a part of the police department, so I cannot speak to what the environment is like when things of this nature are occurring. 
and when they're also, you know, dealing with the number of calls and um, cases that they are dealing with. What I do know is our detective bureau is lacking um, in the support. So there are many, many cases that, you know, there's one person, two people working on. Um, we are severely understaffed in our police department. We are down almost six officers, I believe, at this point in time. And they're going to run into at least 50 calls, you know, per shift. So that in itself is an issue. Um, you can't get information out if they're steady on the roads, you know, from call to call to call to call. Who's writing the reports? The same y'all. That's the first thing. So we have to figure out how to get us to the level of staffing that's adequate for our community. That's one. Um, the second piece of it is I think about um, Eastern Michigan University and their timely warnings. Um, and we, some folks, if you sign up for it, you get them if you live in the vicinity. And I was thinking about something of that that sort that we could talk with our communications director about creating. You know, we have listservs, city listservs already. We sent email blasts out to those who sign up. How can we connect that to voter registration or something of, you know, where when you sign up or you move or you change your address, that you're added to this listserv where you can get these timely warnings, these important instances sent to you immediately to know when there's a danger to the community. I think that that would be very beneficial, you know, to, to all of us to be able to have a mechanism to get information out fast. And I think that's a part of what is missing within our community because we don't have something like that, especially in the day everybody's carrying their phones around. We need a mechanism to be proactive and not reactive. So I'm not really here to place blame about when they're wrong. I want to talk about what we can do differently in the future to make sure that everybody gets the information they need. And I have to add, because I'd be remiss if I don't say this, the other piece of it is I'm not always so quick to share things that um, have to do with sexual assault and young people. Um, what I would never want is a person or their parents to have to relive or re-see the details of something that happens to them publicly. That is not something I'm proud of, and I don't think our police department is either. I'm not sure if that was a piece of why it didn't come out the way it did, but I do think there has to be specific strategy in how you share specifically to instances like this that are triggering and trauma-based um, out to the community. So we have to be well-trained, and we have to put proactive mechanisms in place to get information out to folks in a timely fashion. Thank you. Candidate Morgan, if you are the answer. Okay, all right. So you mentioned the Detectives Bureau. There's a question that came from law enforcement. They want to know from all of the candidates, and I'll start with you, Candidate uh, Brown. Um, do you support the need to start a Detectives Bureau in the Ypsilanti Police Department for the city of Ypsilanti's crime? If yes, explain why you do support it. If no, explain why you don't support it. I 100%, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I just talked about the number of cases that we have one or two people working on at a time. We can't get results if we don't have adequate bodies to do the work. Um, we do have a detective bureau right now with one. And so of course we need to expand on that. It, it's just, it, it's asinine to think that one person or two people, like I said, can do all of this work. Um, I think that you know we have to make sure that people are getting the results and getting the information and getting you know the loop flows on situations that are happening in our community. And so I do support you know building up that detectives bureau, but that also starts with getting officers on the road so that they can be moved into the bureau to be trained to be detectives. We don't have trained detectives to do the work, so there has to be you know a focus on recruitment for good officers in our community so that folks can move to the detective bureau to do that work as well. Thank you. Candidate Morgan. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I totally support the uh, detective bureau being uh, more robust. Um, uh, first, we need more increased investigation. I think it'll help with a lot of cases that go unsolved. Um, we think about COPAC and law and these other agencies that are supportive to our city um, lack of uh, structure or lack of uh, reinforcement. So we definitely depend on other uh, enforcement agencies to like uh, the state of Michigan doing investigations when we don't have a protective bureau. So we could do a lot of in-house protective work if we had a bigger, more trained, skilled uh, protective bureau. And, uh, and again, just to close some of these cases and get, bring some uh, closure to some of these um, mysterious and long-standing cases that have been open and just uh, without, uh, we just need some, uh, some closure. Uh, we need more investigations done. We need a better collaborative process with other um, I think we're more robust um, detective bureau to do that. Thank you. Candidate Alfred Houston? Yes, I would advocate for increasing our detective bureau uh, department. We did have um, a larger detective bureau in the, within the department uh, at another time, 
before we began to do solstices. And unfortunately, across the nation, there is a problem with uh, all agencies, all police agencies, having enough officers or hiring officers. People just do not want to be police right now. And that is something that is going to have to be worked on and changed from um, across the nation. And I'm not exactly sure how that will happen. However, I do know that we cannot continue to function uh, with being seven down, seven officers down. We have got to find a way to build up our department. And uh, once we build up our department, yes, I do believe that we should, uh, more people should be moved into the detective field so that the work that needs to be done can be done. It's, it's a very, very heavy load on one person right now. And um, she needs help. And the only way we're gonna get be able to help her is that we are able to build up our, our, our force. So yes, we're looking for more. As I've always said, you know, more of us working together, the better it is. Sure. And I'm gonna stay with you for a second. We have two questions to round out the law enforcement topic and then one final question and we will be done. Um, are you concerned, and this is a question from law enforcement, are you concerned about the low morale for the role control officers at the Slane Police Department? And if you, oh wait, and if you are, what are your plans to help the officers at the Ypsilanti Police Department? And if not, why not? Um, yes, I am concerned about the low morale because when there is a when there's low morale and people are not really satisfied with where they were, it creates um, what we know. If you don't like where you work, or if you things are not right and things are going on that should be changed, you don't want to go to work. And then when you get to work, you don't, you know, it's a, a very sluggish day for you. And yes, that needs to be changed. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that um, that we can change that, but I do know that even knowing that now that because I wasn't aware of that because the officers that I, when I speak with them, they did not indicate that they were, um, there was a low morale there. And I've asked some of them specifically. Uh, I do know that there, I talked to one, but that was the detective and because she's overloaded. So I can understand that, but I definitely will um, start nosing around the police department and find out what's going on. And if there, it is, then we will start to work on it. Thank you, Candidate Brown. Um, so yeah, there is no morale. Like I said, we, I don't, you know, interface with the police department as a whole on a daily basis, but I have gotten feedback from particular individuals about the, the heavy workload of the police. And so we know that, you know, when you have a heavy workload in that way, you're under immense amounts of stress, you're running from call to call, that, that is not a good environment to work in. It doesn't matter how cheery you are. If you are stretched and you are tired, the morale is going to be low. Um, it doesn't matter what type of the leadership, right? How, but you have to be welcoming. You have to be able to listen to what you're sharing. So I think that's really that's really minimal and really important that us as you know the, the leadership body, as well as the chief and the lieutenants and the sergeants, have, to have open their policies with officers to make sure that we have an understanding of what is happening with them, and then provide them with the services that they need. We also have to look at our pay structure. I know that there are unions and contracts, those are things that are negotiated outside of the body of council. We don't participate in that portion. But when, when our officers are able to be coached and taken to other communities because they're getting bonuses that are much larger than we can offer and getting perks and health benefits that much better than we can offer, that's going to feed into morale as well. And so we have to figure out how do we get to that bargaining table to make sure that we are bargaining for the best packages possible for officers that will also draw people in like me into this department rather than going to other spaces. Um, you know, I just met one of our newest officers um, most recently, I was in downtown Ipsy, and his energy was amazing actually. He was really excited about what he was doing, but he did talk about how intense his workload was immediately. Um, and so wanted to be there, um, excited to do the work, came from another jurisdiction, came to Ipsy specifically because he wanted to be here, but we have to provide him with the support so that they can actually actively do their jobs properly. Well, then, a healthy way. 
um, if they are not well, that they want to interface with our community well, and that is going to lead to low morale within the department. Thank you. Can you want it? I'm going to not dance around it, but I want to. Come on, I want to go right at it. I want to end up there. Uh, I do think uh, morale does um, at some point um, reflect top down. Uh, I do think uh, I'm from a, a, a family, a military, and a, a law enforcement family. Um, but I do think uh, there's a, a current disdain of the, of the role that they're, that they're playing um, as, as law enforcement. So I think with all things going on, it's just a tough position to be in, being those in the gap on the front line. I did a ride, I did a, I've done a ride along with the Washington County Sheriff and the Black people to see how they operate, some of the logistics and what they go through. And uh, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there is a lot of stress um, that comes with their position. Um, I, I do visit, um, when I roll with the fire um, fighters, and um, the parade, I think it was uh, one of the parades that we had, it was Labor Day, no, no, Labor Day. it was a parade we had in 2018. But when I was with them, they said they hadn't really interfaced with like a, a, somebody in government over a while. So we want to humanize our police, all right? We want to, um, because they have a tough job, because uh, again, I think they're on the list with teachers and military personnel that have very tough jobs and get meager compensation. Um, and again, here in Ypsilanti, I think our pay scale for our educational um, institutions, for our nonprofits, for our municipal government, and for uh, our law enforcement are, are pretty visible. Um, and, and it could be um, one of those factors that you want to be, uh, first of all, congratulated for a good job because when you do something bad, nobody uh, forget to do some good nobody remembers so we want to humanize our officers we want to high five them and let them know when they are doing the job because they have a tough job and again being strapped uh, it does start from top down with probably more parties more high five more thank yous but this a few more thank yous go a long way but um again um, we hope to um again get some of these and, and, and a lot of these when i do right along i'm just young always some young officers here these are young individuals between 23 and 29 who um who are young, impressionable, coming from different jurisdictions. And so uh, whatever Ipsy is, we've got to learn an Ipsy way and, uh, and how we govern our citizens is fair. <laughs> that human quality is very important <coughs> for all of our public servants. Um, so well said. Final question to round out the law enforcement uh, segment. Um, from law enforcement, the question is, we have concerns about the mistreatment of female officers at YPD. If elected, what are your plans to handle this issue? And I'm going to stay right with you, candidate Horton. Before we start, they have concerns about what mistreatment of female officers at the Ypsilanti Police Department. We, I'm going to repeat it again. Yes. We have concerns about the mistreatment of female officers at the Ypsilanti Police Department. If elected, what are your plans to handle this issue, candidate Horton? Now, I, I wouldn't know if these are allegations that they're found a little bit uh, already under investigation. So uh, regardless of that, I have an issue with how women are treated in the world. Um, and uh, I think uh, women deserve to have an equal dollar, right? And still make a cent to the dollar. Um, but here locally, um, again, those are uh, leadership. Um, those are difficult tasks to, to deal with. We're talking about gender equality. We're talking about gender equity. We're talking about um, protocols, practices, and the good old boy, type of what, where mostly men existed, where females and women are, are breaking into those barriers. And so um, if there are certain challenges that certain women face in those um, arenas that are tough to be in, um, they should be uh, brought to the surface. Again, um, I know there's a Title IX list, so there has to be some civil right um, type of a grievance that can be filed or some type of um, Again, it's different between allegations of something that's filed into something that's um, that's being under, uh, investigated as a crime. And so uh, I do believe uh, the chief is the bearer of responsibility for everything that goes on in the department. And then again, the city manager who runs the city um, has a, an obligation to follow up and make sure things are in order. So uh, there's a protocol, there's a process to it. But I think uh, I don't want to believe that our, our and even it may be true, I don't want to believe that our schools are treating our schools, our businesses, or um, our law enforcement agencies are treating women less. Thank you. Candidate Alan Richardson. Um, I had not heard that, but certainly it is alarming and disturbing. Um, all of our officers or all of our employees should be treated 
in an equitable way, regardless of whether they're male or female. And I will um, look into it. Thank you. I'm sure Tyrone will be following up with you. Candidate Brown. Yeah, thank you. Um, right, you know, this is interesting commentary. Um, hope that it's not happening. I think, again, of course, I think we all believe that women should be treated equitably within any workspace, in particular in law enforcement, which is such a difficult job as it is already and has a history of being dominated by men. Um, I think that one of the things that I think is important to remember is that at one point, you know, which Lenny, we were doing a really great job of hiring female officers. And I remember that they reported to us in meetings when we would have new hiring groups come in and they would come to council actually in meetings. And then the pandemic hit and that kind of process didn't, didn't happen so much with virtual. But I think we have to make sure that we empower our city manager because that is the person who has the purview over the police department and, and is the chief of the <coughs> to look into the things that are necessary to have those conversations. And then of course we interface with police and fire, um, you know, in the ways that, that we do. But we actually as council only have jurisdiction over the city manager and the city, city clerk. And so our job and my job would be to make sure that I'm interfacing with the city manager, to make sure that I'm putting the pressure there to look into what's happening within the department, that we're getting demographics on new hires, we're getting demographics on who's in the department and what's happening, so that we can kind of see in real time, you know, what, what's going on here. And are women getting a, a fair shake when it's time for promotions or when it's time, you know, to, to move into new departments or different roles? I think keeping track and being abreast of what's happening in that way could be really helpful, but we have to be mindful and I want the community to understand that we do not actually have jurisdiction over the police chief, the city manager runs the day-to-day -day of the city. And so our job would be to work with the city manager to make sure that equitable practices are happening throughout all the departments of the city. Thank you. Okay, so that's the end of all of the, all of the questions, right? But, but um, at the beginning of the forum, you each shared your why, right? So now it's only fitting that we end with what. And I would like to know what makes you different? What makes you a different candidate? What makes you a different mayor? What will we see, feel, experience differently should you gain the office of it's land mayor, mayor of this land. So I'm going to start. Mayor Al Richardson. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, my what is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the foundation of what I want to do as mayor all stems out of unity. My what is to bring, to work to bring the city together so that in such a way that we do not have the things that were reported tonight that have happened that we did not really know about. So that we work so close together and that the entire city works as one so that we all really truly are better, that we, we know what's going on. My what is that I will um, work with council and with the city manager. Uh, as the city manager does um, run the city and actually it's the mayor's job to champion the city. The city manager actually runs the city. So, but um, to make it to Lampy better than it's ever been before. Working with businesses, working with individuals, working with the, the entire community in a way that we would all be proud to say, I live in Ypsilanti. And make Ypsilanti a place where those that do not live in Ypsilanti say, I would like to live in Ypsilanti. I wish I could. But it would be to treat everybody in a very equitable way and treat everybody with love and with kindness. And thereby bringing people together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I like to spin on it. 
Um, I think my what and what makes me different is that number one, I'm an ambassador for people. It's literally what I do for a living every day. Um, I'm not here to uh, be an advocate. I'm here to empower. And so that equity lens and that idea of an empowerment lens and an empowerment mindset, I think does set me aside or set me different than some previous leaders. Um, I'm not easily influenced by those who have perceived power. I stand on what I believe, even if the folks disagree. Um, I am able to take in information, synthesize it, and change my mind if that's necessary, if I get the information that makes more sense. Um, you know, I think having good relationships with staff. I work well with staff as it stands already, and my intention would be to strengthen those relationships and those bonds to help move us forward collectively so that we don't have dissonance within our departments and within council and staff. And so I think overall, you know, I just have a clear vision for what a collective mindset and moving us forward is. I think I have the personality for that. I think I'm very much a personal individual and a champion of people, and it's in my heart. And so my hope is that I earn the votes of Ypsilantians to be the next mayor because I'm here to be a voice at the table, but to also lift as a mind. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Morgan. Well, first, I just want to say thank you to, I thought you do. Thank you for moderating. Back and forth. Um, I think my what is a what is, um, first of all, what is it? I'm, I'm grateful to be able to expand the capacity in which I've said before. I just thought about five P's. One, I would be procedural. I'm just having a, a conscious understanding of, of the protocols and practices and um, what I'm able to do within the laws of rights and charter, um, being proactive, being able to initiate and then follow up and follow through. I think uh, being um, a person who understands partnerships, being collaborative and connected with different groups, people, ideas uh, to uh, hopefully create some elemental uh, consensus. Um, then being present, not just ward the city wide, um, having an understanding of what the pulse is of different views of people in the city. And lastly, be a problem solver. Um, we're looking for uh, someone that has, not to have all the answers, but to have a table big enough for those to create a space for solutions. And so we're looking for someone who's gonna maximize his potential in getting on the ground. I have two decades of consistent work here in the city um, in different realms. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to serve on um, city council. Well, I was grateful to be able to serve on city council. And I'm just grateful to be an ordinary citizen to attempt to do extraordinary work. Thank you. Thank you to each of you. Great work. There you have it, community. There you have it. I thought you knew. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we all. Yeah, but that's that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> this, this, this history here. Yeah. For sure. Thank you all for the question. Thank you.